We're going to have a look at adaptations of photosynthesis today. So this is chapter 4.3 of your textbook. Your key knowledge, so the study dot point that you need to know is the role of Rubisco. And notice the uh, capitals in there. Uh, your textbook doesn't do this, but it's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but the role of Rubisco in photosynthesis, including adaptations of C3, C4 and CAM plants. And this is enabling the plants to maximize the efficiency of photosynthesis. So these, this is the study dot point that you need to know for this particular chapter. All right, adaptations to photosynthesis. Now, plants are, are very clever and they have been able to adapt photosynthesis to suit their needs. There are some issues in photosynthesis that mean that plants don't photosynthesize as well as they could and in certain conditions. So plants have adapted to be able to maximize the use of photosynthesis in these types of conditions. So there's three main types of groups of plants that we can organize them into in the way that they fix carbon dioxide into glucose. We've got our C3 plants. Now, these are the ones that we've already looked at. These are the typical plants that you find. About 85% of the plants that we know that exist are using the C3 method. So they carry out the original Kelvin cycle. C4 plants are ones that live in the warm or tropical regions. And this equates to about 3% of our plant population. Then we've got my favorite, the CAM plants. These are our plants that live in hot or arid temperatures and equate to about 8% of the plants. Now, if you're anything like me, those percentages don't add up. But anyway, we're talking about... <laughs> We'll briefly introduce the adaptations first, and then we're going to go into detail as to why they actually exist. So why plants have, have made these adaptions from the C3 plant. Our C3 plants, these are our major crop plants. So in the background there, you can see uh, the soybean plant, the ed ed edaname, I think you pronounce it. Not, <laughs> I'm gonna look that up, uh, but I've just recently found these beans and they're super sweet. You can buy them in the supermarket now and they're really lovely beans to eat. Um, but that's a soybean plant in the background. So this is one of our major crops that we are growing and they use the C3 method. So wheat, rice, all those sorts of things are using the C3 method. We've got barley, rye, oats, soybean, sugar beet, potato. There's loads of different plants that use the C3 um, method. Now it comes from the fact, so we've used C3 from the fact that, as you can imagine, C3, three carbons. So we've got an intermediate organic product in the carbon cycle, and that's your three carbon molecule of phosphoglyceric acid. And we shorten that to PGA, so phosphoglyceric acid, PGA. They grow best in the cool to moist conditions. So whenever you've got the, the cooler area, you've got those plants that are, tend to do best with photosynthesis there. The C3 plants then use the Rubisco enzyme to fix the inorganic carbon dioxide from the air. And as it enters the Kelvin cycle, it's joined by this carrier here, the RUBP. So it comes around and it joins the carbon dioxide with the help of Rubisco and it forms our phosphoglyceric acid here. And this is where we get the three carbon name from. So we've got one, two, three carbons, and that's where our C3 comes from. The entire pathway of the Kelvin cycle actually takes place in the stroma of the leaf mesophyll cells. So you can see the mesophyll cells here, and we've also got more mesophyll cells here in the spongy mesophyll layer. And you'll actually note that we've got a vascular bundle here as well with some bundle sheath cells around it. Well, this will become important when we start to look at C4. We've also got the stroma here where our guard cells are actually open to allow the diffusion of carbon dioxide into the leaf. And of course, the byproduct of photosynthesis, the oxygen will then diffuse back out of the leaf cells.
Now C4 plants on the other hand are found in our warmer more tropical regions and these include the grasses family so any of those long monocot leaves that's included in this family so the grasses. You can see in the background we've got a picture of corn. Corn is obviously one of those C4 plants. When they fix carbon dioxide the intermediate product has this time as you can guess a four carbon so it's oxalo oxaloacetic acid so OAA for short that's oxaloacetic acid and that's what's produced for the C4 process now in the C4 plants they have a different leaf anatomy so it's called the Kranz anatomy and you can see here that their bundle sheet cells are where the chloroplasts are contained so this is our heavy area around here and all the mesophyll cells are stacked around the bundle sheath all right so they're deep inside the leaf now they're arranged in close association those mesophyll cells around the bundle sheath cell so we've got our bundle sheath cell here and then we've got our mesophyll cell surrounding it and the reason they do this is to try and limit the amount of heat that's near the cells. So we'll get into this in a little bit, but our glucose production, we actually split into two stages. So we've got carbon fixation taking place in the mesophyll cells. And then we actually produce the glucose via the Kelvin cycle in the bundle sheath cells. So we've actually separated the two processes here into mesophyll cells and then into bundle sheath cells. And this becomes important when a little later on when we look at how the process occurs. Our CAM plants, now these are my favourite plants and I've actually got something very similar to this at home that I'll bring in and show you. Uh, and I've got this one as well. But these are the plants that thrive in hot, arid environments and are often exposed to drought. So you've got cacti, succulents, things like pineapples as well are part of the CAM family. And these are my favourites. These I love succulents. I have a lovely little collection of them and they just intrigue me so much. There's so much variation in them. Now they're very fancy because they open their stomata at night and then they close them during the day. Now you can imagine that this is actually very beneficial for them because obviously in the day where they live it's very hot. And to have this stomata open in the day means that they would have a lot of water loss and they can't afford to have a lot of water loss. Also, the other thing you'll see is that they're very uh, thick and juicy. So all of the cam plants often store a lot of water in the leaf. And so they're quite a thick, juicy leaf as well. Cam actually means crassulation acid, acid metabolism. So crassulation acid metabolism and that's named after the Crassulacean variety. So it's um, a cactus, and that's the one on the left here that you can see. This is the Crassulacean cacti, um, known as Crassulaceae. And it is able to fix carbon, and it was discovered from that particular family I, uh, quite a while ago, actually. Now, why are there so many different variations of photosynthesis? Well, it's all to do with the Rubisco enzyme and a process known as photorespiration. Now, photorespiration is the enemy of photosynthesis. We do not want to do photorespiration. And Rubisco, the, the naming of that we'll get into in a minute, but the Rubisco has an affinity for both carbon dioxide and oxygen and this is where we come down to a bit of a problem and this is why our cam plants and our c4 plants have developed mechanisms to avoid photorespiration so photorespiration that rubisco enzyme and you can see to the left there we've got an image of that with many many beta pleated sheets and alpha helixes combined with lots of random coils here to join them together. And you can see the subunits built up in here as well. So we've got a green subunit, a red subunit, and a blue subunit here. So our C3 plants use the Rubisco to 
allow the fixation of carbon dioxide from the air into the Kelvin cycle. But as you can imagine, it's not a totally efficient process. Instead of binding with carbon dioxide, it can also, as I mentioned, bind with oxygen. When it binds with oxygen, it's termed photorespiration. Now, you do need to know that term and you need to know what happens when this occurs. The plant loses 20 to 40% of the energy produced in photosynthesis. Hence the name Rubisco. So you can see here, and this is what I was alluding to before, the RU. We've got BIS for the bisphosphate. And we've also got carboxylase or oxygenase. So here's the C and here's the O. So ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Now, you do not need to memorise this name. All right, you do not need to know this name. But one thing I want to point out is it can either bind to carbon dioxide or oxygen. And this is where we get the issue with our photorespiration occurring. So the active site of our Rubisco enzyme can readily accommodate both the oxygen molecule as well as that carbon dioxide molecule. So the two different molecules are constantly in competition for the active site of our Rubisco enzyme. Our photorespiration occurs in C3 plants when we increase the temperature or the plant dries out, so the conditions dry in the cool to temperate regions where the C3 plants thrive, the photorespiration though is not a problem because Rubisco will preferentially bind to the carbon dioxide at those cooler temperate conditions. As the leaves are exposed to higher temperatures though, the rate of photorespiration actually increases and it overtakes, it's faster than the rate of photosynthesis. And this is where it becomes a problem because as that temperature increases, that ability of the Rubisco enzyme to figure out the difference between carbon dioxide and oxygen actually decreases. And therefore, it starts to bind with oxygen. So as that temperature increases, Rubisco no longer binds to carbon dioxide. It actually prefers to bind to oxygen. And so this is a problem for our C3 plants because of course, it needs that carbon dioxide binding to actually bring the carbon into the photosynthesis um, process and create our six carbon glucose. If it doesn't bring the carbon in, it can't create that six carbon glucose and thus it's not going to produce food for itself. So the photorespiration is a real problem because of course it's now bringing oxygen into the system and it can't create glucose. So the plant has to um, keep the temperature low, which of course it can't modify uh, or alternatively this is where we look at the ways that plants have actually adapted to this problem. In addition to the higher temperatures the problem now becomes that carbon dioxide the solubility of it actually decreases with the increased temperature so um, I don't know if you've ever noticed a soft drink bottle or something like that if you leave it uh, in a warm environment, you'll have less bubbles in it than if you have it in a cool environment. And that's because of the solubility of the carbon dioxide in that liquid. So as the liquid increases in temperature, the carbon dioxide can't stay dissolved in the um, cytosol. And so it decreases. And of course, we've got then more oxygen available for the Rubisco to bind to. And of course, we've then got that self-perpetuating issue where it will now bind to oxygen instead of binding to carbon dioxide. Another issue is that as it starts to dry out and the availability of the water actually declines, our C3 plants actually close their stomata to prevent the water loss. And so this physical act of closing the stomata means that they can no longer allow the diffusion of carbon dioxide into the leaf. And of course that carbon dioxide is an input to the Kelvin cycle. And so limiting this means that the oxygen produced in the light dependent stage is sitting there ready to bind to the Rubisco. You can see here in the diagram, we've got an image of the stomata and you can see that it will then close to actually prevent that um, uh, exchange of air, but also of course, water. Water is a, a byproduct of photosynthesis and it will be released from the 
stomata in that process. So of course the plant is trying to restrict the loss of the water as the um, plant dries out so it will close the stomata to prevent that water loss. And so this creates a really high oxygen, low carbon dioxide environment inside the leaf mesophyll cells. So therefore Rubisco is going to of course bind to oxygen rather than carbon dioxide because the concentration of the oxygen is higher. And so it thus in turn increases the photorespiration of the plant. The closed stomata prevent the water loss, but of course, as I've said, restrict the entry of the carbon dioxide and the exit of the oxygen in the leaf. So as a summary, the photorespiration happens when our Rubisco enzyme, so that very, very crucial enzyme that you do need to know about, when it captures the oxygen instead of the carbon dioxide. So this is photorespiration. This is all it means is that Rubisco is now grabbing oxygen instead of carbon dioxide. Of course, by doing so, it lowers the efficiency of, of photosynthesis because we've got no carbon to actually build into our glucose. It takes place when our carbon dioxide to oxygen ratio is low. That is, we don't have much carbon dioxide and we have a lot of oxygen. So when we have this situation, we will end up with photorespiration. Of course, with the increasing temperature, as we've talked about, the Rubisco will preferentially bind to the oxygen rather than the carbon dioxide. So we end up again with another issue where we generate photorespiration at that higher temperature. It occurs obviously more frequently on hot, dry days when our carbon-3 plants, so our C3 plants, close their stomata to prevent that water loss. So they're, they're stopping that evaporation of water from the leaves. And of course, as you could expect, it can't produce any glucose because there's no carbon fixation in this process. Oxygen gas doesn't have any carbon in it, so therefore we can't create our glucose molecule. And it also produces carbon dioxide, so we have no way of actually um, gaining that gaining that or creating our glucose molecule again. So we're, we're still having issues here. All right, here's a diagram of photorespiration. Um, in this, it's, it looks a little confusing, but you can see that there's two sides to this diagram. So you can see one side has the photorespiration and the other side has the Kelvin cycle. So this one here is our photorespiration side here. And this is our enzyme, Rubisco. And of course we have the Kelvin cycle occurring here where we've got our um, PGA produced, which we can then convert to G3P and our um, RUBP here converting through. So this is where our carbon dioxide comes into the system. Whereas if we're looking at photorespiration, we're actually bringing in oxygen. So remember our Rubisco can obtain both. And if we have Rubisco, we create PGA plus PG. So we've got that compound here, which produces carbon dioxide gas. So this is where we we're talking about just on the previous slide where we're producing carbon dioxide um, from this. We, we are able to then create our PGA, which comes back through to our RUBP and back through the cycle again. Um, but of course, we're putting in ATP here and we're putting in ATP here and we're not generating our glucose molecule from this process here. We're actually generating a very toxic product here. Um, so this is our um, PG, so phosphoglycolic acid, and we have to remove this. So we have a series of complex reactions which we haven't shown here, and you do not need to know about the process that occurs, but a complex series of reactions, and that releases carbon dioxide. And we regenerate the PGA, which we need for this whole process, which comes back through to our RUBP and then back to where we could physically turn over to this process here if we had enough carbon dioxide and a, a proper temperature. So our phosphoglyceric acid is what we want. Um, and so we have to produce that here where this um, phosphoglycolic acid is actually quite a toxic product to the cell. So it doesn't want that in the cell. All right, minimizing photorespiration. So our C4 plants have been able to minimize the process of photorespiration by actually physically changing the location of the carbon dioxide fixation 
and the Kelvin cycle during that light independent stage. So remember the, that we're looking at two different types of cells here. And so what happens is the first stage of this pathway where the carbon dioxide is converted into malic acid takes place in the leaf mesophyll cells. It doesn't use the Rubisco enzyme to do this. So it doesn't require Rubisco at this point in time, which is really smart. It uses PEP carboxylase enzyme to catalyze the binding of carbon dioxide to an acceptor molecule. The PEP carboxylase can only bind carbon dioxide, so no photorespiration can occur. So instead of using Rubisco here, they're using PEP carboxylase. And that PEP carboxylase has no affinity whatsoever to oxygen. So there's no chance, even though it's a higher temperature or we might have more O2 in the cell, there's no chance that that can actually bind to oxygen because it has no affinity for it. So therefore, it's only going to bind to carbon dioxide molecules. So there's no photorespiration that's going to occur at this point. The second stage where we actually produce our glucose by the Kelvin cycle occurs in a different cell. So it occurs in the bundle sheath cells. And at this point, our C4 plants produce a steady supply of carbon dioxide from the breakdown of malic acid. And that raises the carbon dioxide concentration in that leaf. As a result, our Rubisco binds to the carbon dioxide, not oxygen, because there's tons of carbon dioxide there released from our malic acid. And that is then bought into the Kelvin cycle. So the plant is really quite clever in the fact that it produces the malic acid in one cell and then it transfers that malic acid and breaks it down back to its carbon dioxide in the second cell where there's no oxygen present. And so our Rubisco hasn't got the opportunity to bind with oxygen. This is explained really well with Andrew Douche and Ed Rollo. So he goes through it and talks about, and he's, he's created this beautiful cell where he shows you what's actually happening here. And so we've got two cells. We've got the mesophyll cell, which is up here. And we've also got the bundle sheath cell, which is here. And so our PEP carboxylase, which is in our mesophyll cell, binds to the three carbon PEP, and it binds that carbon dioxide to it to create a four carbon malate. So this is your malic acid. And that malic acid is then able to pass through the plasmodesmata. So that's this joining tube. So the adjoining tube here, it can pass through the plasmodesmata um, into the bundle sheath cell. Now, the bundle sheath cells have some chloroplasts, but they don't have the light dependent stage occurring in this, this area. And that's to prevent oxygen being produced near the Rubisco. So we don't want any oxygen near this area here. Our carbon dioxide is then able to be released from our malic acid and we're able to release that carbon dioxide and send it straight into the Kelvin cycle where our Rubisco is working hard to bind that carbon dioxide into our glucose molecule. And of course this malate, because it's lost its carbon, turns back into pyruvate, which you will know, and goes back through the plasmodesmata up back into here and this is our precursor for PEP. So we can now bind our carbon dioxide again with our PEP carboxylase. Remember ASE for enzyme. It binds to create malate and off we go again. So we've got in here our chloroplast whizzing away. We've got our PEP carboxylase, but it's removed the Rubisco from this area. So we've got the light dependent reaction happening here, but we've got the light independent reaction happening in this chloroplast here. So there's, they've separated the two, which is really quite smart. And so we have our Kelvin cycle working independently of our light dependent phase, which is occurring in here. And just at the side here, we've got some interesting facts about the Kranz anatomy. So the light dependent reactions happen almost exclusively in the mesophyll chloroplast. So that's here. The light independent stage happens almost exclusively in the bundle sheath chloroplast. And this is what I was explaining just before. Our bundle sheath cells lack grana. So there's no grana in here. There's still some thylakoids, but there's, there's no grana occurring in here. The walls of the mesophyll cells are permeable to gas 
All right, so the walls of the mesophyll cells are more permeable to gases than those of the bundle sheath. So we're, we're sort of keeping the gases out of this cell, which means that the only way we can produce that carbon dioxide gas is by breaking down the malate into that carbon dioxide molecule. Our rubisco is almost completely absent in the chloroplasts of the mesophyll cells. So there's no rubisco in here or very little. And that's to avoid the photorespiration occurring because of course we've got oxygen in this cell here. All right, so we're avoiding that photorespiration from occurring in that cell. It's very smart. In C4 plants, the pathway from carbon dioxide to glucose in C4 plants occurs in two stages. So one, we have our carbon fixation stage in the mesophylls. So this is where we form our malic acid. And that's occurring in those mesophyll cells that surround the bundle sheath. We use the enzyme PEP carboxylase to join the carbon dioxide to a carrier molecule phosphenyl pyruvate. So that's the PEP. And it forms an inorganic acid. PEP carboxylase enzyme can only bind carbon dioxide at its active site. So it can't bind oxygen. And this is a good thing because then we can't end up with any accidental photorespiration. The end product at this point is our malic acid. So that malic acid is then sent through to the next stage. The use of the PEP carboxylase enzyme by C4 plants to fix the carbon dioxide into an organic acid eliminates that major problem of photorespiration. So they've actually avoided photorespiration by doing this. Our Calvin cycle then in our bundle sheath cells. So remember, we're in the mesophyll cells. Now we've moved into the bundle sheath cells. And this is where our malic acid goes into that cell and through our plasma desmata. And we can then bring the carbon dioxide back out of that cell and start to then form our glucose from our Kelvin cycle. So this happens in our bundle sheath cell of our C4 plant. And it involves the transport of the malic acid from the mesophyll cell into the bundle sheath cell, and that occurs through the plasmodesmata. In the bundle sheath cell, our malic acid is continuously <coughs> converted to pyruvate and carbon dioxide. So our malic acid here is, and you can see there's four carbons here, is converted into pyruvate, which is our three carbon and the carbon dioxide, which has obviously one carbon. The released carbon dioxide creates a really high concentration of carbon dioxide in the bundle cell. And so that means that our rubisco has plenty of carbon dioxide to bind to. And so thus it's able to then use the organic acceptor molecule, the RUBP, that enters the Kelvin cycle and produces the glucose. So we've got a high concentration of carbon dioxide there. We don't have any oxygen available. Remember the walls of that cell don't want to allow any gases through. So the only way that they can get through is in the malic acid through the plasmodesmata. And then it's broken back down again to produce our CO2 and our CO2 is then fixed in the carbon, uh, Kelvin cycle in the cell. So we've got a steady production of carbon dioxide in the bundle sheath cells. And so that means that our rubisco is obviously going to preferentially bind to the carbon dioxide, not to oxygen, because there's little oxygen available in that cell and we're pumping it full of carbon dioxide. All right, on to my favorite, the CAM plants and photorespiration. So these have adapted in two stages. So they do one stage at day and one at night. So they actually split photosynthesis into two different stages. The carbon fixation stage takes place only at night when the stomata are open. So they open their stomata at night, allow the exchange of gas. They close their stomata during the day, which means they have to spend all night fixing that carbon dioxide into a form that they can store and then use in the daytime. The Kelvin cycle that produces glucose occurs only during the daytime. Obviously, it needs the light from the sun to allow that to occur. So we need to be able to have that process occurring during the day. And so the stomata are closed at that point in time, which means we need some way of obtaining our carbon dioxide. Both stages take place in the mesophyll cells. 
All right, our carbon fixation at night. Our inorganic carbon dioxide from the air is fixed again by our PEP carboxylase enzyme. So the same thing that they're doing in C4 plants. This time though, it's being stored in the vacuole. So the PEP carboxylase is forming our malic acid and of course it can't bind to oxygen so it's only able to bind to carbon dioxide therefore we're actually generating that malic acid and it's it's unable to bind to oxygen it stores the malic acid in the vacuole in the mesophyll cell so it stores that overnight so it just builds and builds and builds malic acid and stores it in the vacuole ready for the next day the next day it closes its stomata the organic acids are released from that storage as the temperature warms up and those stomata close. It's then broken down as the product from malic acid, it's broken down into our carbon dioxide and our pyruvate. So we're able to release again that carbon dioxide molecule and our pyruvate comes back to then come back into this cycle at night later on. So this creates again a high concentration of carbon dioxide in the mesophyll cells and produces an environment in which Rubisco can then preferentially bind a carbon dioxide for entry into the Kelvin cycle. So showing you again the differences between the two. Now note in C4 they're the only ones that have a different cell here. So we've got mesophyll is blue and we've got the same cell here day and night. But this one here, the C4 plant, has the bundle sheath cell. So remember, our, our plasma desmata are used here to transfer the carbon dioxide through into the Kelvin cycle. And this one here comes from your biozone text. So this image is straight out of biozone. For our C3, our carbon dioxide is fixed directly from the air. The stomata have to be open, which lets air in, but also lets water out. The light independent phase occurs in the leaf of the mesophyll where our light is also captured. This exposes Rubisco to oxygen. And so thus, as that temperature warms up, we can reduce the photosynthetic efficiency of our Rubisco where it preferentially binds to oxygen as the temperature heats up. In C4 plants, they've separated that into two steps. Our carbon dioxide is used to produce oxaloacetate in the leaf mesophyll. So this is your malic acid. And so this diffuses into the leaf and our carbon dioxide is then released by our Rubisco deeper in the leaf, away from the oxygen and also away from the higher temperature. If you think about it and it's coming down inside the leaf, it's coming away from that higher temperature as well. So we're thus increasing the efficiency of the Rubisco. Not only are we not allowing it to obtain oxygen, but we're also trying to keep the temperature down a little bit by putting it deeper in the leaf. Our CAM plants, the stomata are opened up at night to take in our carbon dioxide and that's stored as our malic acid. And this reduces the water loss on hot days. So they're able to then close their stomata during the day and they reduce the Rubisco exposure to oxygen again and increase the photosynthetic efficiency by pumping that CO2 back into the cell. They're able to reduce that um, oxygen concentration by having a steady supply of carbon dioxide. This one here is just showing you all three, so the comparison between all three, and it's a good one to go through or have in your notes, so your um, chapter summary notes, this one's a good one to pop in there, because it's effectively showing you the difference between all three of these variations. So our C3 plants are our standard most plants are C3 plants. They are a cool temperate environment. They don't like hot temperatures. So their optimum temperature range is between 15 and 25. Once it starts to get hotter than that, then they start to have problems. The enzyme they use is Rubisco to fix the carbon. And of course, this is where the issue occurs, where if there's more oxygen there or higher temperature, it's going to preferentially bind to the oxygen and thus photorespiration occurs, and that's not what we want. For our C4 plants and our CAM plants, they both use the PEP carboxylase to form malic acid. So they're going to make that malic acid. So here's our malic acid, and they are going to store that or use that. So 
in our cam plants they store it and then they use it in the day for these ones here they transfer that into the next cell so our bundle sheath cell they transfer that into the bundle sheath cell and then where rubisco is and they're able to then use that so we've got our pga our oaa and pga and oaa in our cam plants the location and number of carbon fixation events well we've only got one event here and that occurs in the mesophyll cells for our c4 plants we've got two events first in our mesophyll cell where we form the malic acid then second in the bundle sheath cell where we use the malic acid for this one here same sort of thing but it's again in the mesophyll cells first by day second by night oh sorry first by night second by day all right so we've got this process occurring in the same cell but at different times of the day the location of the kelvin cycle mesophyll cells mesophyll cells but for c4 plants they have that additional cell the bundle sheath cell the enzyme to start the kelvin cycle is the same for all three so it's rubisco that we're looking at this enzyme here is a really important enzyme for photosynthesis Presence of chloroplasts in the bundle sheath cells? Well, no, not for C3 plants, nor for CAM plants, but yes, there are for C4 plants because remember their first stage is in the mesophyll and the second stage is in the bundle sheath. So there must be chloroplasts present here for that to occur in the bundle sheath cell. Stomata, open. No, they don't need to be open for C4 plants because of course they've got the malic acid and no for our um, cam plants but they have to be open at night all right so we need the stomata to be open to produce the um, malic acid but they're open only at night they close during the day photorespiration at high temp in high temperatures and low co concentrations well it's really high at this point this is not what c3 plants want c4 plants and cam plants are designed to work in these environments so low to zero for photorespiration occurring and the optimal temperature range you can see between 15 to 25 30 to 40 degrees for these and above 40 degrees for these plants they can live in in environments that are above 40 degrees and that's pretty amazing i think all right for you to complete we've got our biozone and i've popped exercise 4.3 up on your learn on as well and i really do want you to watch ed rollo so this one's 5b and i've got the links both on our class page and they're also on this powerpoint if you want to download the powerpoint and annotate the link is actually here so you can click on this link and it will work as well but it's in the class page so please watch ed rollo for this unit it's really really quite good and clear uh, and his animations and explanations are fantastic so make sure you have a look at that watch that after this video uh, and that will solidify some of your understanding of photosynthesis and how this is all occurring